I've lost my bearings what episode. This is five, right? Uh, yes. Yes, cool. it is. I think you should just start the podcast with that. Just be like, this is episode five, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode five of the Surprise Legal Podcast. I am back from my slumber. And joining me today is Sam and Ewan. Hello. And our new guest. Uh, hello, I'm Ben. Like, I'm pretty well known within the UK community, maybe even in Europe. I'm the resident player of mediocre sets such as Monogatari and Kiznaiva. Uh, Achievement-wise, like, I guess the only real achievement I have is winning Team League last year with Brandon and Ewan. Uh, I think I've top-hated, like, pretty much every other major wise man in the UK for the last, like, few years, with the exception of a few WGP events here and there, like Neo Showdown 2013, Neo Showdown 2014, uh... Japanese World Qualifiers for 2015, I think. Uh, one other one, I don't remember. But I've always just fallen short of the mark here and there. And I guess like I'm most next well-known for quotation marks running the Salt Mountain Card Games Discord. If you could even call what I do running it. <laughs> I think like that's enough for most people to recognize who I am. So yeah, I guess we'll just leave it there. Yeah, I guess most tournaments where you're not playing and you're also judging, right? Yeah, that's pretty much, like, that's a major thing at all. Like, in the last few years, I've been more judging than playing. Like, the last major tournament I actually played in that I wasn't a judge for was the WGP thing in Dortmund, like, three or four years ago now. Back when Monogatari wasn't restricted. That would would have been, like, before most of us started playing, I think. Yeah, just to really date, like, how long I've been playing. (laughs) (laughs) You're very, very old guards. Yeah, really early into our lives. Um, good guy to have in for Monogatari and Kiznai reasons because there have been two really noble league events I guess you could argue over the past couple of weeks and those were won by Monogatari and Kiznai which is kind of funny uh, I guess we could talk about MK first since we were all there mm-hmm. yep. yeah wow gee I wonder who won that <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> actually, like, double check what you said, and it is actually, as of this season, the most points scored in an event so far. So I guess that feels pretty good. Did you go completely undefeated that day? Completely undefeated, somehow. <laughs> so, so uh, what encouraged you to use Monogatari on that day? Uh, I gave you two decks. I gave you Bang Dream and Monogatari, and you chose Monogatari, so I played Monogatari. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying is I'm responsible for you playing. 100%, yep. <laughs> <laughs> Should just give him the points, man. He's clearly at them. Oh, yeah, clearly. I mean, I'm going to do this to overtake you and Brian, as it stands. But yeah, you, you had like a pretty good jump from like 28th into 12th or something, so that's pretty yep. handy. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, yeah, well, I think the like, incredible thing as well is obviously, other than Milton Keynes, there was another Monogatari top in EuroLeague in like Italy or something. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I saw that on my Facebook, and I was like, Wait a minute, what? <laughs> yeah, that, that was um, a bit of a smaller event. And mm. it's it, like with, every time I've seen an Italy event, it's like Steins Gate comes second, Log Horizon first. Like, I think they're just memers over there, really. But well, they're it's still. Like, he posted his list in the comments. Let me have a look for that real quick. Mm. Uh, it's in the time we'll go over what else talked. We had like how many players were there? Again? Like, I think we had twenty-one. Yeah, like that's the number I was thinking of straight away for some reason. Uh, I didn't think it sounded right. But yeah, no, that, that, that's probably fine. Yeah. I'll um, I'll post the list in the Discord since it's like right in front of me. Oh. I I found it. I found it. It's very similar to mine, just with a few choice options. Different. Uh, we can talk about that in a bit, but yeah. So, uh, Ben beat Matt Mead in the finals using the newly released Goblin Slayer. Yeah, mm-hmm. that deck is really sick. Mm. Yeah, well, it wasn't the Goblin Slayer that you might expect. There wasn't like eight pants. It was actually uh, the eight Elf shot. Pop. Yeah, yeah. It's quite quite funny how a couple of weeks ago there was like a whole few minutes that dedicated to trash talking shot triggers, and then the finals <laughs> of this tournament had twelve out of sixteen shot triggers. Feels good. It feels good, man. 
I can't think of any other decks that people were playing that had shot triggers either. Besides, like, Kadokawa. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, third place was Brian. Yeah, yeah. Brian. Just, just a rabbit, yeah. Yeah, I don't think he actually uh, got any extra points from that, though. Thankfully for nah, Brian's been on Brian's been on a, a weirdly good streak with uh, D- DMS and what what else has it been using? It's been rewrite. No, not yeah, rewrite. that's it. Yeah, yeah, it is rewrite. He okay. hasn't played Fate yeah. yet this season. Hmm. Uh, he has a couple of times. It just hasn't been worth points. So yeah, yeah it's, been, it's been when he's already gotten a lot of points. Yeah, I think yeah. a lot of his uh, got juice results are testament to how popular Summer Pockets is in the UK as well. Yeah. Mm. Because of how good the Warner Sat Calendar is against Summer Pockets. Speaking of stuff that's good against Summer Pockets, let's talk about Ewan. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, so um, some of you guys might have seen the, uh, the uh, post I dropped in Global, but going into Milton Keynes, I was very excited about. Uh, rediscovering this uh, Death Gun level 1 Slayer from the Sautu TD, uh, which uh, is a level 1 Slayer that has uh, Act Pay 1, Rest 2, choose a guy and it loses a level. So I was like, okay, great, like, I'll shove two of these into my deck, and then whenever I run against Summer Pockets, I can deal with a 1-2-1 one, one with that, and then using the Act, use the uh, one Ace Yuga Herb Bismarck to go over the second, or at least tie with it. Thought that was gonna be like a great idea, gonna get an easy like four one Swiss. Uh, didn't play against Summer Pockets all day. It was a super dead card. Got swung over by level zeros most of the day. Pretty upsetting. Uh, but I am on the lookout for more tech against Summer Pockets because the Sword Art that matchup is really brutal when you can't when you're like focused on gaining board control and you can't maintain it against these two ones uh, it can get pretty dire so sal also only has one whirlwind combo right uh like one combo on a wind yeah it's the one zero like on attack pay one search right? yeah invites to party yeah that feels pretty bad <laughs> <laughs> I'll just not play Yuki in order to play something strictly well. Oh, and just play both. Uh... Just, oh. <laughs> just trigger wind. Just my, trigger my wind. AT has a good matchup against Summer Pockets for this reason, right? Not just, yeah, but um, your wind combo is actually on a good card in AOT. Yeah, you should, um, <laughs> you should adopt the Connor Pelham 8 wind build just to really the mental matchup. Is that a Connor Pelham build? Yeah. Ah. Spicy. Oh, I'm looking back at the Euro League results for Milton Keynes and it says that Matt Batten played Japanese No Game No Life when he played English, right? Oh, yeah. The, yeah. The, there's a whole re- reason for that. Uh, All right. Uh, um, but I guess Diego forgot to fix it because All I actually right. posted, I posted that and messaged Diego straight away saying he actually played English and he forgot to uh, nice. and he hasn't added this on the website yet. Yeah, it's a bit of a a, dis- a disaster, but or well, like I think other than the two rogue tops, I think like the rest of the event was fairly standard. I'd say. Um, I created an irreversible game state, which sucked. But apart from that, yeah, I I think I heard about that. That was against Daryl, right? Uh, uh, no, it was against uh, Sonia. Oh, okay. I was that like it, it ha- um I've had it happen I've had something happen quite a lot but I'm generally able to backtrack um so I was like really, really concentrating on her game state uh, I hit her to like two five two four something like that um and she played her uh she was running uh, a gold bar Yuragi. so she got her change out. Um, and swung at me with it, and I was like, oh, okay, great. I've got my anti change in hand ready. Uh, play, played it down, and because I was running um, Bard Gate, I had like yellow splashed, so it's the anti change uh, stock bomb with the unplayed draw drop. So 
played the card, draw drop, and then someone calls from across the room, hey, aren't you still level one? Because I wasn't expecting to triple cancel the turn before, and then just, like, there's no way to, like, restore the game from that. Uh, for it's example, kinda, I, I don't, I kinda I don't think something like that has ever happened to me, at least not in the last, like, couple of years, so... That kind of reminds me of that time I, uh, oh, this was also against Sonya, where I triple played the level threes at level two. Because, because you triple was, cancelled. Yeah, because I triple cancelled, <laughs> and it was a RAM combo, so I, I forced an irreversible game state by shuffling cards in. Amazing. It's, uh... I know I've had a situation like that before in the last year at Sheffield, um, where I somehow ended up Leveling yellow three times and then I played down a Mikasa three two and drew a card. That wasn't good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, always, people, we've all been there. It always feels you bad when that happens. You still like pops that event or came second no, or something. No, I, I actually, just, I actually like just the first round. Yeah, yeah, that was the first round and I won out of that event. <laughs> <laughs> Has AOT ever had like a legitimate win at any of our events? <laughs> I, I feel I feel like no, right? Because either that happens, or like you know, you or I pilot, and we just come like zero x. <laughs> um, when I won uh, the uh, the buy card in twenty sixteen with set one AOT, I'd say that was pretty legit. Sweat, I sweated for those wins against um, Michael Justice with Fate UBW. <laughs> yeah. Good times. Uh, I I mean, my luck with AOT since then has been pretty dark at the English tournament. I like, went to three VCS across Europe and uh, bubbled two out of three of them, went X3 at the other. Used Sunshine, won Worlds Invite, decided to switch back to AOT for Worlds, go to drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, your first loss in at Worlds was a bit tragic, though. That wasn't I'm... exactly... Uh... Your nah, deck fault. It, it was fine because I was going to lose regardless. So I guess the only legitimate win that AOT has ever set two AOTs has ever picked up was our team league event. Yeah, yeah. feels bad. And hopefully this happens again this year. Was the team league even legitimate? Isn't it just a coin flip depending on who goes second in the mirror? <laughs> well, actually, no. I think I think I actually think I actually think Gemma went first that game. <laughs> I think like the only, the only reason I won was because like I think I was like six in and she hit me through refresh and I just cancelled on the exact last card and then I hit her back and then she refreshed the climax. I think it was mm. the big decider there. It's sorry because she um she got her revenge on Jimmy three months later. What build Ooh. was Cobain playing for Bang Dream? Um, he ended up only using his. Generic English deck, Yukina Yukina. Okay. Um, he was actually hoping to play Million Live on the day, uh, but he forgot to order some uncommons. So nice. he had like 47 cards. Big rip. Yeah, I, I ended up using Million Live on the day, and it did not go as well as last time. <laughs> What's your build again? <laughs> uh, eight stock tall, the 3 7 event. What's the, finish? What's the finish of that again? The 3 7 event. Is oh, that thing, right. Yeah, it's, it's that. Uh, and it falls back on the Magus Fury stand. Right, right. Using the one to like rearrange the top two cards of your deck and try to make sure you hit a soul trigger. I feel like that is a really strong build, but I just can't like... Every time I try and build Minion Live, I always default back to the on reverse Masashi level 3. <laughs> I think that card's just nuts. Nah, I think that's a big mistake. I mean, I, I think I think it's like fine, but I would know I really don't enjoy needing to reverse at any stage of the game, but especially not if. Yeah, that's fair. Like, um, it is pro it's probably stronger than the um standby top end. I think the but... standby top end is like one of the worst. Yeah. Which is a shame because like the standby level one combo is really good. Yeah, I've I've been trying to mess around with the idea of uh, using the Hibiki stock soul combo into the standby finisher, but that's I mean the three two combo kind of allows you to use standby and have a good finish for it. But all, all like the main reason I'm using it is just so I have 
a reason to use both the Soul Claw combo and Alpaca in the same deck. <laughs> <laughs> Alpaca's just good. I think it gets to a point where um like you just run Linkless standby and then you run the um the New Year's Swarm Oath. Um, oh the Julia combo, yeah. I'm still determined to try out a build of Million Life where I use the two soul combo. Big oof. I think the difference is though, like unlike something like Review Starlight, if you stand by your level one combo early, it doesn't just win you games, which is kind mm. of sad. So I think that's my issue with standby in Million Life. It, like the impact of the climax itself is just kind of weak. Like I think your best standby target is pulling up the brain the level two brainstorm at level one, and then like during your next turn, just getting a free free board. Hmm. And it, even then, I think that card is slightly overrated. For personal reference, um, when you mentioned Revue Starlight bringing in a level one board, is this, is this like the one one that gets markers when it kills something? I uh, know it's the one one climax combo that changes into the two two. Ah, okay, okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, that's like there's only one. I I only know of one Revue player like outside. Like I know there's two. There's Emily and Balthazar. And Emily plays the yellow build, and Balthazar plays that build. So I know that's why I know of that build. Yeah, I've actually seen Emily use standby before, and I think the marker things is what she was using. I mean, that's the one time I played against Revy Starlight, actually. <coughs> uh, yeah, like t- taking personal notes, seeing if I'm going to be a Revy Starlight player in a couple months or so. Mm. <laughs> I think the set's going to be quite good when it comes to English. I'm, like, I think it's well positioned. Yeah, as as long as um, either AT falls off enough for me, or I find like a really good solution that's better than Eight Wind, I'll be really happy. Because I, I think Eight Wind is Eight Wind is fine because you have the yellow level three in Anna that pulls out a guy. Yeah, it's really Sorry. solid. Yeah, uh, uh, reversing things at level three isn't like that big of an issue. It's because of the nature of yeah. how it works, but. It's just more Shimakaze, that's Aaron Heller. Yeah. So, um, like, the, the more and more time that goes on, um, the less and less AOT players we see. Uh, more, more, like, especially when the new South set comes out, a lot of people will, like... I think AOT is already starting to fall off. I think, it, like, there it, were only, it, like, one or two players at Lisbon who were using yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, it, it fell off um, as soon as Bang Dream since you came out in English. Yeah. And it's only fallen from there. Like, it's not a set that's attracting new players. Did Bang Dream set 2 come out before or after ReZero? Before. Yeah, before. Oh. Uh. So, do any of you guys know Monogatari enough to discuss the differences in the lists? Uh, I, I'm not I, the guy, I think. I, I could always try my best, but I wouldn't consider myself very qualified. So there's like two major differences between his list and my list is that he's running level one bombs, whereas I'm not. Mm-hmm. And he's also running a slightly more streamlined level three lineup. So his level three lineup is four copies of the Hitagi Climax combo, the on attack burn, four copies of the you know the banned snail, the restriction list. Yeah. Uh, two copies of the vanilla healer from set two, and then mm-hmm. two copies of the early play 14-5. Whereas my list is three of the Climax combo, four of the Snail, uh, two of the Shinobu Vanilla Healers, two Kamaru early plays, and I'm also playing uh, one Vanilla Hitagi heal from set one. So just get an extra heal instead of the combo. Mm-hmm. And instead of bombs, my level one lineup is uh, four Akatsuki, four Shimakaze, and I'm also playing two Kaiki and two of the green 1-0 Hitagi from Nisei that rest to give a character on reverse blind stock. Mm-hmm. So I guess like his build is a bit more higher floor, but mine's a bit higher ceiling. Is how I describe it. Um, I think to an I like like hearing that side by side, it just sounds like they're preparing for different meta games. Um, I like Kaiki's. I, I mean, I guess like both Kaiki and the bombs are meant to deal with like big guys. Um, you know, to an extent, and trying to like uh, get. Yoshima more consistent, but... I, like, like, it, it sounds like, you know, you're comparing to SAO lists. 
and one of them's like cut the second Huey for a third Rize or something, and like overall they're basically the same. It's just a little. Bit... Yeah. Oh, he's also playing the blue Hanekawa assist, which is five hundred in front, and once per turn when you play a character with experience, scry one. Oh, the clairvoyance. Yeah, I'm trying to remember why what I cut that for because I know I don't play it. It's not. It's not really clairvoyance right? because it actually does scry the top of bottom, right? Yeah. It's oh. a really good card. I am. Oh, but only procs once per turn. Yeah. 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 And the unfortunate thing is that with Weiss rulings and the wording of once per, of this ability activates once per turn, it means that you have to do it the fir- on the first experience character you play. Mm. Which is, re- I think that's the reason I cut the card in the end. Yeah, it, and like as soon as you choose to not activate on that first one, you can't activate it. Again. Yeah, it fizzles forever. Super sad. But see, uh, the fact that he's not running Kaiki, I had to screw with that because I think even like outside of just meta gaming. Having an option for when you inevitably hit something that has a counter that's going to shut down your level three a bit more. Yeah, it's, just, it's very commonplace, right? Or like, also just Kaiki at level one. Like, it's just the extra fu- the extra five hundred to help you get your Shimakaze reverse, and also the denial of like you know counters from like Gotcha use or whatever or Titan. It's just really sick. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, really good. Um, also, regards if you're playing if you're playing a series like Monogatari, I think you make sense to take more risks and more reward. Otherwise, yeah. you'll just be playing. I, I, I think like that, yeah, because like you're already kind of dealing with a handicap as it is. Yeah, I, I guess I'm just of the mindset that if you're playing something, you have to have a really good reason to use it over something else. Besides, I like this show. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's just, not that's a real like, reason, <laughs> and anyone who argues otherwise is wrong. Um, I, I think that's something that um, we've seen like a lot of the newer sets that Bushiroad released like struggle with. Um, things like Steins Gate, in particular, like there's no real draw to sets like that, which is why they don't see much representation. Um, yeah, I think like the last time we had a set with like a real defined identity was, pro- I want to say Kislaiva, but I might be wrong. Um, <laughs> there, there have been a couple since then but it, like it is less like you know having like a unique identity and more just like being like strong enough to consider playing if you want to like win events yeah but i mean like if, I, if you just like think about the most recent releases you've got stuff like uh katakawa bunko uh overlord review starlight to an extent uh yuna to an extent steins gate uh summer pockets like these all feel like very homogenous set design. Um, Summer Pockets was unique when it came out. It's just been copied since then. Yeah, I guess. I'd say Hino Logic is probably pretty unique. Well, like, not since, like, other sets like Frank's has been released, but when it was out, it was definitely a very... Yeah, I get... ...its own thing. Fine. But it's a bit of Summer Pockets, right? It started off as being unique, and then it got copied. I don't think Hino Logic was even that exciting, because it basically the same thing that um, Sunshine did, just different. Well, like, the, the Mechanic-wise, it was basically just a better Vivid Red. Mm. I appreciate that and no one else here was playing when Vivid Red was better, <laughs> but like, Vivid Red was literally trance at level 1. So like, you played a 1-0, you played a 1-1, and then you pulled out a 2-2, that on reverse clock 1 draw, and like that was really strong, and then you had like burn 5 on attack. So Ooh, like... So yeah. powerful. Yeah, we're like talking about like you know twenty fourteen relics here, but like, <laughs> at the time that was good. Like so, to me, like I always saw Hinalogy as just oh they did Vivid Red again. Yeah, like, going going back like that far, you've got like you know, again, Gurren Lagan like was kind of like Hinalogic to an extent, uh, and then you've got Apocrypha, which you know again a very homogeneous set. But yeah, Ap- I mean, Ap- Ap- Apocrypha is Apocrypha um... had like the command seal gimmick. Yeah, that was oh that yeah, was, this... that is incredibly unique and also very flavorful. It but, is very but, good. but then, like, not that impactful a majority of the time. Like, the only time it ever really comes up is if you're running Mordred. As your level 3 combo, which you should be, but, like, that's pretty much the only card that really uses it. Yeah, well, like, there were other cards, like, meant to support it, but none of them were really worth using. Yeah, like, you had the, zero, the level 0 Jean people play, like, as a support. Mm. But, like, it's not like the effect that flips up a command seal is, like, game-breaking. <laughs> yeah. I've actually seen this that just use that just as a free act to prop an on reverse blind stock. 
<laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Uh, I guess, like, No Game, No Life was kind of unique? Yeah, No Game, No Life is um, kind of like, it it was a set they brought out right after they'd um, kind of jumped the power curve. I spoke about this on the um, the PTT podcast. Um, It was like right after they'd like really tested the limits of how high they could bring the power curve with things like Sunshine and Heen Logic. So um, they did like... They were bringing out more like um, homogenous sets, and then they started bringing out like experimental sets that were like, okay, uh, here's like this kind of edgy idea for a card. So like the Steph counter or yeah. the, um, the Steph standby combo cards like that. They're like, okay, if we try if we try out these cards, we don't want to accidentally make them too strong and like accelerate the game even further. So we'll just put them in like a kind of dodgy shell of the set. And let people play around with them. Yeah, but like at the same time, like it kind of causes you to forget these sets. Like you know, like no, I think no game no life is a pretty forgettable set in terms of power level. Yeah. Same with same with Steins Gate. Same mm-hmm. with Yuna. Like to an extent, kind of the same with Goblin Slayer, but that's still like finding its ground. We're still teething that deck, so I, yeah. I can still be surprised, but. I, th- I think I think um, a lot of people are excited for Goblin Slayer because of the minor soul shrink, but I don't yeah. think the set's going to be able to support getting like two to three of them out consistently enough. I I've been toying around with that build a little bit, and I I I've got odd opinions on it. Most people swear by always trying to get the early plays out, whereas I don't think you want to early play unless you can guarantee you're getting three out. I think yeah. two is fine. I think it's very rare that you'll um like, like you know, like say you get two out and your opponent plays an early play in a one K one, they're getting one damage through that turn. I mean you still get a massive tempo swing from it. Yeah, but the another part of the issue with the priestess combo is it has to reveal to get the minor soul. So it yeah. hits on events, but if you hit a climax on it, then you do kind of. If you double early play and one of them hits a climax, you lose a lot more value than yeah, if you were three that's and that's, you hit two. That's what the alarm is designed for, though, right? Yeah, but the even even if you've got the alarm, it can't guarantee it because it only checks two. Yeah, it's not like Healing Logic where the alarm like goes you turns you from having a mediocre turn to an amazing turn. The, the alarm is you can still fail. It's a lot like Railgun in that sense. We have to like mm. commit really hard. <laughs> yeah, I think um I've my build for it also uses the three four heal five event. And I think if you can it does revolve a little bit more of, uh, around luck, where you have to just try and cycle through pants a lot. But if you can maintain a good border going like two, even maybe like if you're getting really lucky three turns at level three with the Neg Soul constantly, then you basically just win the game. Because even if you get taken up a high enough amount of damage, you just heal back down. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, like with that, with that situation though, surely your goal is... Rather than having multiple turns at level 3, you want multiple turns at level 2, right? Because you want to be dropping these early plays and then negging the soul. That way your opponent's at level 3 while you're still at level 2. That's where you get your advantage from. Yeah, but I think that's only really uh, massively useful if you're managing to early play 3. I think if you can know, if you early play 2, if they interchange one of it, then you feel kind of bad about that. If they interchange both, then you feel real. I don't, like, I don't think you're in a good position at all if, if they double anti-change you. Which I don't, is th- I don't possible. think running double anti-change is correct at the current time. Like maybe if Goblin Slayer like has a huge upswing then it will be. But um as of like initial release most people should only be running the one. If Goblin Slayer becomes like uh, this recent level three combo becomes really really good. You can actually see like uh an upturn in Success from series like Nanaha, where they early play and just go, Oh, bounce your things. Yeah, that's another thing it kind of suffers to is anything that can just bounce your board. It was Steins Gate's time, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually an interesting discussion we I had with some of the guys in Portugal, which is that, like, we were talking about the differences between English and Japanese, and I like, 
for, for some reason, it only just clicked to me like that this weekend past that English doesn't have TLR set two, which means mm. they don't have wormhole event. Yeah. And at first I was like, oh, you guys don't have wormhole event. And then I realized, wait, wormhole events are really busted card. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, it, but like the English game in general, um, like I think, you know, playing both four, that's, the Japanese game is like a lot more focused around early plays. Uh, you know, like, especially with Summer Pockets, but even prior to that with Hinologic and Sunshine, and even before that, people were just running, like, any early play their set had to contest other people's early plays. Yeah, I think it's because, like, English is... Like, compression is harder to come by in English, almost, I feel. Like, you don't have decks like Rewrite or Hinologic that just cancel three times for, like, four turns in a row. Like, yeah. I feel that's very rare in the English format. That's why, like, you don't see uh, stock flushes in English because they're just not as needed. Um, so, you, you do see them these days just to deal with um, Bow and Bang Dream, just because they they're not like compressing, but they're generating stock. Yeah, it's, it's not like a must. Like you know, you wouldn't like Idle Master now plays the you know the green stock flush event, whereas before it was an optional cho- choice. Whereas. Like, it's not a card you always want to see in English. Like, Sal, yeah. just, ha- Sal just has the luck of having it on a character. <laughs> yeah. A-, a character with another useful effect. Yeah. I was actually, actually, I'm looking at the list of sets, like, how you mentioned how No Game No Life was just as they started reading in the power level. Mm-hmm. And, like, it's actually really distressing how I look. And, like, two years ago, within the space of one year, we had the following releases, which was AOT2, Ordinal Scale, uh, Miku... Ek- Miku Extra Booster, yeah. uh, Bang Dream 2, Konosuba 2, and Hinologic Extra Booster. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and as soon as they started um, planning for the next ban list, I think they realized that they'd really, like, oversteps. Yeah, because the next, the next two releases... Uh, well, they did Hinologic 2 after Konosuba 2, but after that, the next two releases were Gurren Lagann and Saikono. Which are both quite weak. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so Psychono is um, kind, of, uh, kind of another good example of um, homogeny, even though it's the first time we saw Icy Tail, which is now kind of a staple effect. Um, a lot of the, like, bar like a couple of the events, which are what people end up building around, um, especially like, you know, recently over the last like three months or so, um, a lot of Psychono lists look super generic and like nothing special. Yeah. Mm. Icy Tail is an interesting cool. example of uh, like what we mentioned earlier about them making sets by but being like very cautious in their power levels. Where we've seen Icy Tail go from a climax combo at level three to just a, a TD on attack combo at level I mean, three. That, that was in this piece of like a couple of months though. I feel like that hasn't happened as much, though, right? I can't think of anything else that's really become that commonplace. Yeah, I can't. Either. Um, they've there was um, they only just started introducing the um level three with a climax combo with on play pay one search for another copy of this level three and play um... it to stage. Um, I think the first time we saw that was in Unisan, and we've seen it another couple times since then. Uh, we have seen no, a I version think... of it in Kimono Friends. The no, Owls the first... did something similar. Similar. No, the first version was actually a lot older than that. <clears throat> I'm trying to remember where it's from, but I remember seeing there was a there was a tutu that did that, like way way back. Right. I mean, like yeah. When, when I say new, I don't mean like completely original. Ah, uh, right. Yeah, I yeah. I mean like and uh, like yeah. It, it was like a that you know that was like put on a pants and it was on attack burn one, so it felt quite pushed with unison. I think. Yeah. Um. They wanted to go okay. If we, you know, if we don't have this draw or heal, but we try this alternate on play, will people still run it, or is it kind of bad? Um, and I think we got a similar card in Overlord uh, with a slightly better climax combo, but still not fantastic because they're still quite cautious about it. Mm. Um, I, I think Overlord is actually like a really cool set. I think the um, the one o on reverse combo, uh, the like uh, gain power. Yeah, I think that card's really, really well designed. It's just yeah. a shame because, like, Overlord feels like it really should be there. Like, I think, like, I'm really surprised that Overlord's not better than it is. 
Yeah. It's just Everyone's missing those. Much um, it is missing like a really impactful finisher. Like it's got finishes that are okay, but nothing that is super exciting. Um, and it's just missing like a couple of like core utility cards. Yeah, but at the same time, like those core utility cards is what would cause it to become homogenous, right? Yeah, That's, it's kind yeah, of like it's... a catch twenty two. Like you either make it really strong and thus homogenous, or you make it very unique but as a result kind of weak. I mean, you say that, but I think Summer Pockets is really strong because of its uniqueness and the way that it doesn't follow what other sets do. But instead, other sets have now followed it. Yeah. I um, mean, like, it is, it is unique, but I think the strength comes from other things, like, you know, the, sure, like, compress to memory and then burn from memory and then early play, like, two... Because playing early plays, level two is at level one, is not new. Like, we've seen it done quite a few times before to great success, like, with P5. It's just more like the way it gets there. It just, I just want. I wouldn't even. I wouldn't really call it unique. I would just call it better. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's I, yeah. Maybe. Um. I think with P five, um, like yeah, we've seen like two one early plays with four or more characters before. Even back in like AOT, people uh, set one. People would splash green for the Levi two one, uh, to try and like get reverses in lanes and stuff like that, which was like. Dom that happened, uh, and uh, like summer pockets feels more like uh, every time I look at a summer pockets list, it looks like it's kind of built around that two one, and it doesn't matter what else you put in your deck. Uh, whereas Persona feels more built around Doka because that's the broken thing that Persona does. Yeah, I've seen summer pockets lists that have like win standby, win gate, win bar. It's like it's all about the way it's defined yeah. by the two one, yeah. It's it's really the fact that it's so big for a two one as well, and the level one that happens to change into it also draw drops in place. So it's just more consistency regardless. It's a uh, it's good. Uh, I wanted to shift oh, back to yeah. Goblin Slayer, by the way. Uh huh. Um, I want to talk about the uh, level one combo, like the Goblin Slayer one specifically, because uh, I think it's really good. I don't hear it talked about very much. I I think it's really good as well. Mm. This this is the uh, combo on gate on attack search or salvage the torch event. Yeah, and there's yeah. two different torch events uh, you can grab, but the main one that you're going for is just the top four counter from the TD. Mm. It's um it's yeah it it feels kind of scary to analogize it to um the Kasumi. Christmas cast me, but I think they are pretty similar. I just yeah, I, like I had a is... big debate with Luke over like comparing the two. I just think um, the Goblin Slayer one is uh, slightly worse because of being a lot less selective with what um, Torch can grab. Hmm. I overall, Yeah, I agree with that. Quiet. But I think the card itself is much more defendable. Because like, a lot of the times with stars, if you've got the gate in hand, if you've got like the climax in hand again for stars, you just use your stars events to re-grab the Casimirs usually. Yeah, but there's nothing wrong with that. I no, think that's really but, strong, if anything. It's like yeah, Zekin for Zekin. It is really strong, but Goblin Slayer doesn't need to use, doesn't need to try and top four to, into itself because it can have a much better chance of staying alive. So you can grab different options. I think much better is a bit strong. Uh, I, I don't think you care about keeping the Casmi alive, because... Like, uh, Casmi gets big enough to reverse on your turn, and then you can just, like, gloves off, let your opponent do whatever, and if you've got a second gate, you, like, unless you've refreshed by accident, you're pretty good to go. Yeah, plus, but Goblin Slayer... Like, you have Remy Globals, which can protect, quotation marks, your Casmi. You've got the, uh, the 1-0 Sire that can reanimate your Casmi, like... There's a lot more tools you have for getting there anyway. So unlike Goblin Slayer, where like, you know, if Goblin Slayer, like, if they, if you triple field Goblin Slayer and they clear your board, you, it's gonna, you're gonna really struggle to like do something in the turn after, unless you like got set to level three. Yeah, but that's not always. That's against like most matchups. That's not always gonna happen because the Goblin Slayers get reasonably big on defense. I mean, how it's, big are they exactly? Can you they're 6k on the, they're, they're 6k themselves. They're yeah, like, they're going to be 6k on their own. You've probably got the Priestess 1-0 back row, so that makes them 7k. Right? 
It's, it's, a, glo fun. it's a global 1k only during your opponent's turn. Oh, right, right. And is there a 2k counter for Goblin Slayer? I think there is, right? There is. Yeah. So you've got, like, you've got that going, which is not too bad. I think the fact that you can also, like, since the torch is a counter to, um, whereas if you're like using Christmas Cast Me for, uh, for like deck control in a subsequent turn, you have the option of just like playing it during your opponent's turn when you trigger three climaxes as well. I think people overhype that quite a lot. Like we've seen, um, like the one o top four on a counter profile more and more frequently. Um, I think one of the more notable examples is in GGO in blue. Yeah. Um, and it's like people always kind of go, oh, like because we see so many just one o top four events uh, without the counter icon. As soon as people see it, with it they like start like imagining these like I, I, I think, great I think scenarios it's... where it mills towards a climax. But I think those are actually pretty rare. And don't they're uh, they're often. like definitely a, it's a dangerous card to to use because. The last thing you want to do when you're being attacked is just mill a climax off the top of I, your deck. I mean, you should. It's got to be a really good reason if you're doing it while you have a climax in your deck. I'm just meaning like if you're on low deck, just like accelerating through that deck. There's there's probably and, like, some you're, like you're sweet spot numbers where you actually want to mill because you're that decompressed. And but like if if that's your options, sometimes you just want to take that risk. I mean, a whole other thing as well is it's kind of a different story when. This one zero event is, um, uh, is this this event counter is just outside of a level one combo. Like if if it was this one zero event counter, this is top four anyway. You're probably using it during the turn regardless because you're turning it to a character to play. But the fact that you search it or salvage it after you've attacked and you don't have an opportunity to use it afterwards, I that's mean, what makes it more applicable here. The, the reason I brought up GGO is um, it had a couple of cards that grabbed it, um, almost in the style of like uh, the calling card in Persona. Um, I think it was like a lot less aggressive, it was like, pay one, send this to memory, salvage this, stuff that's a lot slower, but the, like, the support was there for that, and that event didn't really see any play. I think the difference um, is that with Persona it's, because it's so much more aggressive and like spammable, I think that makes it way stronger. Oh yeah, no. Um, but what I'm saying is, like, uh, I don't think the event having the counter icon is what makes it good. I guess. Right. Nah, I I agree with that. But having it have the counter option is just a nice touch. It's an, it's well, an I think option it for you to use. I I think it varies. Like, it's it's nice, yeah. But I think it's not the like the fact that it's a counter is not the reason that you go to it. Oh, of course. I think the main reason you run that combo is actually for the gate trigger above like anything else. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, like especially if you're running um priestess, I think uh, having the gate trigger to set up whatever you're missing for that. Mm. Will be there's um really there's a nice little tech card that interacts with the torch quite well, and it's a it's a level zero cowgirl that has on play drop a torch, salvage a character, and also has on play drop a climax, salvage a character. That's uh, it's, it's quite nice to sort of balance out because the torches can only grab from their top four, and if if you know that you have a specific target in your bin that you really want, you just slap that down, drop the torch, and grab it. I mean, how many of those do you have to run, like, for that to actually come up enough there, right? Because if you I mean, if you run it at the number that you'd run uh, a drop climax salvage, which is like one, maybe very rarely two. Um, then you're not going to see it the times that you need it without like, needing to top four into it, which is kind of defeating the purpose. I, I, I mean, you, pro you probably think of it as you're just running that card anyway, but it just happens to have more targets that you can discard to grab something. Yeah. I, I, I mean, like, I, I think, I, I don't think that saves Torch, at least. Um, no, nah, it doesn't save it, but it, you've got, like, it's another option that you can do with the Torch. Goblin Slayer is really good. <laughs> no, I, I think you're, really? I think you're showing it that I don't think it's worth it. I I think compared to the, uh, I definitely think compared to the other options you can run, at least in like the priestess build, I think Goblin Slayer is probably the best one for it. 
The uh, the sword maiden combo I think is only really good if you're dedicated to try and and triple early play priestess. I think if you're going to try and triple early play priestess, you'd play the witch combo, right? Uh, I'm gonna have to remind myself which one the witch combo it's is. The stock soul, and then give two characters on reverse blind stock. Hmm. I don't know if it's other characters or not, but like, surely like you know, that's what the compression you need on Cause attack. Because then you're not relying on you're not relying on events in your deck. Yeah, it's on attack. Give something else in this card on reverse uh, blind stock. Yeah, um, I think you can you can compare that really closely to the um, chopper in. Katakawa. Yeah. Uh, which is just... Um, it's slightly, like, slightly, slightly worse, because you don't have the choice, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, chocolate is it's on a win, right? And then it's, uh, um, you can choose to have a Shimakaze or a Blightstock 2. Mm, it's like comparing the Sword Maiden to the Witch is a bit interesting, because the... Uh, the Sword Maiden's on a book trigger, whereas the Witch is on a Stock Soul. However, the Witch does have the potential to get slightly slightly bigger. The uh, the Sword Maiden with the combo in play is going to be at least 6-5 swinging, whereas That's the... It's more for on attack in the current metagame, game though. Especially for an on-reverse, yeah. Mm. But the... Uh, the Witch... Oh, the witch also only gets to six five, and that's if you mill two order characters on play. Like six, like six five. Um, for comparison's sake, is um, like it's analogous to the um one hundred four five gain one k for two or more other Shimakazes on like book and shot. Funnily enough, that is exactly what the sword maiden is. It's a yeah, four five right. two or more others, uh, two or more other orders gain a k on a book. Like, I think the, the difference is that like you can double field a witch, and like if your opponent has like a small lane, you can stack everything onto like the other witch. Mm -hmm. And like blind stock two in one lane is good enough a lot of the time. Yeah, but like you can basically do the same thing with sword maiden, except the sword maiden guarantees its uh, well, effectively guarantees its power as long as you've got cards in play. But if you if you whiff your mills on the witch, then you might not even get to like reverse yeah, the one lane. But at the same time, like, we, milling is also very, very good. We, it we is. See, uh, especially with um, things like Summer Pocket. They have, like, two big lanes, and then a lot of the time it's, like, uh, a coin flip or spare 1-0 or something super weak that you can stack two procs on. Uh, so, yeah, you could, ha you could have a zero there and it would still reverse. I think that comes up less than you think it does. Hmm. Do you guys think we've exhausted Goblin Slayer at this point, or do you want to talk about the shop build a bit? I don't think the shop build's that interesting. I think it's like pretty high rolly and not much else. I really want to experiment with the dwarf finish in with like a non-yellow level one game. Oh, okay. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. Isn't the, hang on, isn't the dwarf? Is the dwarf worded as for each? Soul icon reveal, or is it it's for each soul icon, not okay, for each not card, card with a soul with a soul I, I, icon? I, I thought I thought it was actually X equals the number of cards with a soul trigger icon rather than for each soul trigger. Uh, let me check. Yeah, because if it's it for each card, card, then it becomes it becomes way better. Yeah. Uh, while while doing that, I'm gonna uh, while the Arsenal level three comparison. Because I forget how that's yeah, I've got the well. uh, I've got the little Akiba translation, but that that's a Ooh. Google Translate <laughs> translation. So that's a bit dodgy. You know, yeah, it specific, it specifically says cool. card. Yeah, so it doesn't work with stocks with like two soul mm. cards. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Me meanwhile, and that's uh, that's like officially translated a bit different to how it was done before. I think. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, well, the Asna checks for uh, X is equal to the number of trigger icons revealed among those cards because it was revealed alongside. Yeah, it combos with a yellow stock soul. I mean, the, di the difference is that deals X damage, where this is deal one damage X times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, I, I really want to give it a go with something that isn't level one, because I, I think the if you're going mono yellow, you're restricted to a lot of stuff that you probably don't want to play if you had other options. Uh, I think there's only like two or three like 
cards that you're unhappy with in that deck. I I like it. I saw um like the game the game that I played against Matt and the games that I watched him play. I saw him proc the um the level one. It's like when you trigger this specific shot salvage. Yeah, uh, like every time That's he fielded the... it, and it was really gross. So, yeah, you've like, got like, the I... uh, level zero where if you trigger the the dwarf combo, you salvage the dwarf or the lizard man, and then you've got another one where if you just trigger a shot on its attack, you yeah, salvage, so I think. The, the one zero is any shot you get to salvage. It's the yeah. brainstorm that you have to hit a specific shot to salvage a specific card. Yeah, but that... Um, but like, you, I think you play both of those cards anyway, right? Mm. If you're running mono yellow, yeah. If you're running like eight shot, sure. But I think like the dwarf only gets the salvage if you trigger a shot on his attack. Yeah. So that's like... Unless you've like tri fielded it, that's only like a one in three of of it. Isn't there being a the one look to at trigger? Two, that's not how statistics work. But the, the, well, sure that's the, not what like it's not a one in three chance of triggering, but it's a one in three chance of it being the one to trigger if you're going to trigger a shot. Sure. Uh, kind that's of yeah, really like, backward stats. <laughs> this is yeah. Well, that's like, <laughs> you're going to play like non yellow cards. You'd play like you know. Something that looks at the top two, right? That way you can tell like when to attack with the dwarf to get the salvage. Hmm. Because I feel mm. that like if you're, this, this despite the fact that he whiffed like he whiffed four of them in the games we played, I still think that brainstorm six is really good. <laughs> yeah, the brainstorm six is cool, but I the fact that you're like mill six is really good, but. When you're only able to grab one card maximum off it, and you've got like no plotting triggers on your climaxes, yeah, that's fair. It's uh, it's a bit of a you kind of need to be able to win board a bit better. Yeah, to make it's, up it's, for that. it's an argument I had with uh with some guys on the card games Discord about the difference between like having actual brainstorms versus having stuff like uh Utah or the zero yellow levels during killer kill, where whenever you do a thing, look at top four. I guess the next best comparison would be the union that reveals a Mega Man in top fours. Like, yeah, it re you get much less reward when you're compressed, but the trade-off is that you get a guaranteed reward all the time. Mm, but that brainstorm isn't even guaranteed. Like, no, yeah, but like it's way you can more. Still whiff even on a mill six. Yeah, like like Matt did. I'm just saying, like it's more guaranteed than a regular brainstorm. So like, sure, that that's the payoff. Yeah. I think, like, I think if I was gonna if I was gonna not run eight shot, I'd probably go for something like I'd want I'd probably go for the uh, salvage brainstorm. Oh yeah, like for sure. If you're not playing eight shot, you definitely play like a real brainstorm. Yeah, maybe, maybe because I think like Goblin Slayer is one of those decks where you look at the utility and like it it doesn't need the guaranteed plus one at level zero, but it could definitely always do like a good plus two at the early, in the late game. It's, yeah, it's, not like, think... it's not like Kiznaiba, where like Kiznaiba's like, I'm always, always, always having cards in hand. Yeah, I think Goblin Slayer has got a very, a, a pretty decent level zero game, but needs it needs to like, if you're running Priestess and you're not early playing, playing Priestess, then you're kind of not really doing anything. Yeah. And if you're running anything else, again, you're probably also not really doing anything at all three, except for maybe standby build. Mm. But I... I'm under the I'm I'm of the opinion that I don't think standby and goblin slayer is very good. I think all your good targets in Star goblin slayer are aren't like are your level threes. It's so underwhelming compared to all the other options you have with yeah. your better climaxes anyway. So yeah, like you've got the two two goblin slayer, but that's a bit of a deceptive target. Like it's got hand on court, which is cool. But it's a 6k base with 1k for each other. But mm -hmm. if you're doing the cowgirl combo to bring it into play, the cowgirl bounces to hand, so you're already a space down. Yeah, that's uh, kind of weird. But it also comes with the benefit of freeing up a slot to stand by something and if you trigger it. Yeah. By, I, I think in, in that situation, you want to stand by a level 3, which means your standby isn't really getting much value until you hit level 2. It's fun. Uh, so, yeah. 
to, to talk about our topics in a reverse order, speaking of kids neither, we could talk about the Newcastle tournament as well. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't actually there, so please fill me in on what happened. So, none of us were there, but wow. uh, this was actually... Uh, I mean, obviously I get the reports from UK tournaments, so I have to fill them all in, so I get to see some standings, which is cool. Uh, but Newcastle so far this year has only had like six to eight player events, I'm pretty sure. But then the one this month had 13 out of nowhere. And there's a pretty obvious reason, I'd like to think. What did they offer as prizes? I don't actually know. Uh, so um, they offered, it, it got a kind donation of loads and loads of Y stacks uh, and collections. Uh, and they basically said for the next few tournaments, whoever wins, they basically just get to pick one of the collections and keep it. Jesus. So this could be like, you know, for, like one of one of them's head, for example, was like a schoolgirl strikers playset. Yeah, there was um, oh. nice of a deck as well. And oh. stuff like yeah, I mean, you, I'm sure you know the circumstances. But yeah, that's like definitely the best prize support for our locals you could ever. Yes. Ask for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, I'm really conflicted because that sounds really, really good, but I know the context, so it's it's really, really <laughs> yeah. painful. Mm. We won't worry about that here, but. That's good for the yeah. turnout for locals. That's like yeah, definitely thirteen player tor- tournaments in Newcastle for probably the rest of the year. You'd think, press well. Like yeah, that. I I know when they initially announced it, um, you were talking about going. There are a couple of Birmingham locals who were talking about going, and like we'd never travel up to Newcastle mm. otherwise because like you know. At, at least Sheffield is closer and generally gets more players, but mm. that price support really compelling yeah it's a uh, certainly interesting for competition in the league seeing as we get the reasonable size local Pretty yeah cool. but yeah so like about Lawrence kills now because i remember i was speaking to her about it like a while ago and mm. we were discussing the options so i think the difference between her list and my list is that well i guess the way to put it is the difference between my list and every other list is that i'm still running cats here at early play whereas she just Trim down to four, four of the Hanukkah stock charge combo, and then four of the Sonazaki. See, I, I know if I was building Kiz Knife, I'd probably just go four gates rather than uh, I got a four door come back. You know the deal. <laughs> As opposed to four, four of the pants. Yeah, yeah. The only downside is then is that like I thought I wanted to do that because Cat's Hero is just such a good card, mm. but the problem is that you then have a really bad finishing profile. Yeah, unfortunately. I mean, in in the words of Luke Tonks, uh, Kiznova doesn't finish; it just doesn't die. Does. What a best thing! Like, if you're not playing pants, you're not playing. You, that's four healers you don't have. Yeah. Like my list currently has eleven healers, four of which are blue. So if you yeah. cut those and you max out on your other healers, that's still only eight healers, four of yeah. which discard a card. Yeah, I, I think um, back when Luke used to play, he had like only one or two Hanukkah early play. So it didn't actually, you know, most of his healers were um, the blue pants combo and the um, heal to stock. Yeah. Like, uh, I play three of each myself. Yeah. Like, uh, like I, I think it's quite easy to go, like, overboard with healers. Well, I say quite easy. Um, like, you can find yourself in position where you're, like, a bit overboard. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely, like... Because only one of them is in any play, so the red one and the blue one both come out level three. So mm. it comes to like, do you have enough hand to like go? Okay, play the red one, discard a card, heal to stock. Play another red one, discard a card, heal to stock, and then play a blue one. Yeah. So it's that's that's my issue with the deck is just that, like, you get to level three with like eight stock, and then suddenly like, within within the snap of a finger, you have no stock and no hand. And you haven't really done anything to win the game. Yeah, exactly. Like, for that reason, I kind of want to go back to, like, just four pants, because then you're always going to have the Sonazaki combo. Mm -hmm. Even then, like, the Sonazaki combo is not that good. Like, it's really easy to play around. Although I think it's a card that... It's a card that becomes more effective the stronger your opponent is in terms of card quality. Yeah, it's kind of like... um... No, it, it's kind of like a mirror effect, like you know, like you're bouncing back what they're doing. So, like if what they're doing is stronger, you like go as a result. It's almost like a kind of MOBA, like um, you know, one of those characters that can like uh, 
it get gets stronger the bigger the level gap is stuff like that. Uh, yeah, it's it's kind of, it's kind of like a it's a weird hard to try and like think about, especially because um, like the longer time goes on, we're actually seeing like weaker and weaker finishing profiles, or you know what we regard as weaker and weaker finishing profiles coming out. Like I think yeah, a lot of people are hyping up the um the Katakawa shot finish, um and you know because that's like probably the best finishing profile we've seen in like a while. Uh, I, I think I think that's one of the main things Bushi are trying to do to like slow down the game a bit is printing less strong finishes and just like focusing on the early game a bit more. Probably the best finishing profile printed all year was an accident in the Lisa IRE stand thing. <laughs> <laughs> kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, especially when you look at something like um, Overlord, where like it's got a bunch of really cool tools, but then the finisher is like almost the Green Chain Chronicle army deck finisher. It's just it feels really like discordant. Yeah, um, and I th- I think they wanna they wanna try and slow the game back to like OG, like you get three vanilla swings, and then maybe a couple extra instances if you're lucky, and that's your top end. Rather than people dying from 2-6 majority of the time, like when Shinon came out, and stuff like that. Cool. I guess uh, we can move on a little bit as we're nearing the end of the episode. Uh, and talk about how our lives have been in the past few weeks. Uh, who who do you think had the most uh, exciting couple of weeks from you guys? I've uh, <laughs> I, I've done a hell of a lot of traveling for a very very mundane reason this week. Having witnessed this, I can confirm. Yeah, <laughs> having taken two trips from Wolverhampton all the way to Milton Keynes just to play Beat Saber. Yeah, and play uh, a Vanguard tournament, but you know, Beat Saber. Yeah, our friend Cobain uh, has been bringing his recently acquired uh, gaming laptop with his VR setup to uh, my locals. Uh, he gets to set it up every time, and everyone gets to look silly playing VR before the tournament start. It's pretty spicy. Yeah, it, it was the um, it was the Tuesday, wasn't it? That I came the second time, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah, the Tuesday was especially fun because I just went played Beat Saber all morning and entered Vanguard and just won. Oh, you actually won! Wow. That's... Yeah. <laughs> the, okay, so the standings for that was ridiculous. We had six players, two zero threes, and four two ones. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Fifty <laughs> percent of the players were also playing Angel Feather. Quote and... unquote two ones because you know Bushy Road draws equal losses. Yeah, my uh, I, my finals match was over in time, and it was a double loss on the first game. Yeah. Wow! <laughs> and it was a, it was an angel feather mirror match, and we were both five damage with one card left in deck each. Nice. We we should try wow. to steer this away from becoming a Vanguard. Yeah, it, it was a that was a it was a hectic game to say the least. But yeah, Beat Saber, very fun. I I just want to mention standard socks, by the way. <laughs> don't, don't worry, premium sucks too now. It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, as I uh, alluded to in the last episode, uh, I went to help out at a uh, anime games convention in Birmingham, uh, hosted by the guys at Annie League, which uh, I've heard some like shady stuff about, but the event itself was. Uh, pretty smooth. Uh, I was helping out on the tabletop section. Uh, had a few guys come up to me and say, like, oh, hey, do you know anyone here who plays Weiss? Uh, luckily, I have my deck on me, so I got to give some newer players some games and some pointers. Uh, and it was nice to step out of, like, a hyper-competitive, uh, like, you know, and, and you know, step outside of our friend group and play, play just some casuals uh, outside like an event, because that's not something I get a chance to do that often. 
uh, that yeah, there was like uh, one guy from Loughborough, a couple of guys who'd uh, been to Birmingham locals before that stopped coming. So I'm trying to you know added them on Facebook, and I'm going to try and encourage them to come back. Yeah, it was um, it was a good experience. I only saw a couple of local players. Uh, but... When when you realise that we've become too hardcore for your taste. <laughs> yeah, like it, it, like um, it, but I think the, the most disappointing thing was, you know, I, I had this guy with like, um, yeah, it, it was this um twelve year old kid, and you know, he was like, oh, uh, uh I'm like, I'm I'm interested in white shorts. Can you like give me a game? I was told like you're the guy to come to. So I was like, oh yeah, sure, no worries. Uh, you yeah, uh, know, my mate who was working with me on the stand, he. I got the kid to like guess what series I played by looking at me, uh, and he said, "Well, obviously, no game, no life." And oh, oh no! no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's kind of tragic that this twelve-year-old kid knew that no game, no life was in Y shorts. Oh no, it gets better. So I, I um, sat sat down with him. Uh, he won rock paper scissors, so he mulliganed first, and he dropped. Um, four cards from the TLR trial deck. Oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> wow. It was, um, uh, but yeah, like, every time, like, someone offered me a game, I felt really scummy, because the only deck I had on me was, um, Yuki Shop. I really regretted not having, um... So let me, let me guess, you didn't drop a single game all day? Oh, no. Yeah, no. <laughs> like, it, like... <laughs> Like, people, like, hit me to three, and then they died nearly all the time. There were a couple of games I had to, like, money out of, but it was still super relaxed. Uh, it did definitely feel really scummy. Uh, kind of kind of wish I bought something like Chain Chronicle. It could have been a bit more back and forth, but I think having English cards helps out as well. So it's yeah. a really cool middle ground to try and tread. Yeah, it's a really weird thing to have, like, in Portugal where... Every, like almost everyone exclusively plays English, mm-hmm. and like at first I was like, "Oh, that's interesting." It's kind of like the opposite of what we have here in the UK a bit, and yeah. I just found like, but like the way that they approach it is that they had some Japanese players, but there were some issues with like toxicity and like you know the Japanese players refused to cooperate with the English players, mm-hmm. so they kind of like each went their own way. Mm-hmm. But like they're dealing with it really well, which I found really interesting. Like you know, they're, they're, they're guys that like. There's one guy I was speaking to, he, uh, he'd only been playing Weiss for five months, and like within three months he was like, okay, that's it, I'm going to buy Sunshine. So he goes out on Facebook and drops like 300 euros on a meta Sunshine deck, gets scammed the first time, gets his money back from PayPal, and then buys another, a different Sunshine deck from some other guy. And then like within a month, he, figures, he, he learns to play the deck, he figures out the combos, like how to time your stuff, and you know, I think he like... His team didn't do that well, but you know he already like understood the game a bit, which is like just really cool to see. Like you know they're really like they're approaching it really intensely. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So so this kid I was talking to, uh, he he like played Yu Gi Oh, and he said he like uh popped his locals a couple times. Uh, I don't know how big it, like the locals are up in Loughborough, but Yu Gi Oh like all all around tends to be pretty like big. Uh, but like playing against him, he was definitely like really intelligent in what he was doing, and I think Weiss is very much one of those um, learning curves where it starts off um, and you like learn stuff really quickly, and then it peters out towards the edge, um, and you start getting like diminishing returns for the amount of time you put in and the amount that you get out. Yeah, um, like it, especially we've seen. Um, a bunch of the Vanguard players come and start playing Weiss in the UK, and they've all taken to it really quickly. Um, you know, p- picking up like uh, strong English decks like Peter with Sal or Cobain with Bang Dream, and getting good results in return. Even if yeah. it is like Max with a Clan Subaru and it's hella autopilot, but just. <laughs> he, he knows how to play the game. It's important. Yeah, I think the big difference is like you know games like Vanguard or Yu Gi Oh. It's it's a lot about value, whereas Weiss is a unique game where it's more about tempo than anything else. Yeah, because so like, um, it's like a yeah, set to an extent value that's just expected every turn anyway. Yeah, you've got like um, a balance of tempo and value that you have to work around. 
Like, I think that's why you kind of feel that, you know, people pick it up really quickly, but then stuff like knowing how deep to go with your searches, knowing, like, how to play around certain cards, knowing when to, like, you know, when not to go for your combo, stuff like that, is, I feel it's a lot harder to pick up if you, like, if Weiss is not your first game. Yeah, I, d I definitely um, see, like, a lot of people, I, I think, like, the point where, um, like, you get over like the like beginner phase and start having to deal with like larger problems is um especially in like the Japanese scene is when people get access to restless brainstorms. Uh and you see people brainstorm like two or three times a turn. Uh and you know they say they're like focused on like milling their deck. But there's you know their compression is like fine, probably like slightly Below average, but nothing worth freaking out over. But you know, they end up refreshing like every other turn, um, and they they kind of like enter that like galaxy brain, like play over the playing when they don't need to. Um, and I think after you learn to like scale that back, that's when you start getting into like really complex one in two hundred games kind of scenarios that you have to try and figure out. <laughs> Cool. I think this is a pretty good point to wrap up now, seeing as we've been going on for quite a while now. Uh, so, thanks everyone for listening. Uh, thanks for joining me, guys. Yeah, no, no problem. I, no I, just, I just wanted to throw a quick shout out to Tom, our tech guy, for hooking me up with this new computer. Uh, and thanks to the other guys for actually saving the show a couple of weeks ago when I didn't have a computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's about it. See you guys.